Welcome everyone. Um, we are incredibly fortunate uh, to have Manuri Gunawadina with us today. Manuri is the founder and CEO of Health Match, a clinical trial matching platform designed to make accessing emerging potential treatments easier for patients. Manuri is a former medical student and has a passion that lies in delivering uh, digital technologies to improve inefficiencies in order to deliver better healthcare. I have to say, I'm personally really excited to be talking to you today, Manuri, because I love these topics where I actually have no idea really about the space that you're working in and it's an opportunity for me to learn and I'm super excited and I think the audience is also super excited. Um, and I don't know too much about the early days of your of your journey and how you actually came to found Health Match. So I'd even just love to start there and uh, for you to give us an overview of what you did before Health Match and what led you to, to starting the company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess, like, um, as you mentioned, Health Match is a platform that um, enables people to access clinical trials and, and treatments um, really efficiently. And I, I think um, really, I guess, a couple of years back in med school was where I came across the problem. And I don't think I really set on the path of um, starting a company or, um, you know, trying to build something. It was really, you know, final year of med school, working in the brain cancer space. We were running a clinical trial. Um, you know, people with brain cancer don't have um, that long to live and there aren't really any treatments that work. And so um, we were working on a pretty exciting, cool new vaccine um, with Duke University, trying to find patients to be part of this trial and only had two patients in all of Australia. Um, and I, I was like, okay, this is, this is my first exposure to clinical trials. And I thought it was crazy given the context of, um, you know, going into clinic and seeing these patients wanting to, you know, travel all over the world to access whatever was the latest cancer treatment for brain cancer. Um, and so that was like my first experience of, hey, we're trying to find patients for this clinical trial. There are patients in clinic that are wanting to find trials. What's going on? Why is it so difficult? Um, and it became really obvious that it's it just happens to be the way the system has been set up is if you know the best clinicians or you're visiting a particular uh, hospital site that's you know, cutting edge like Peter Mac in Australia, for example, you might get access to these new treatments and therapies, but otherwise you just get you know, the standard treatment that's out there. And um, it became really obvious that um, access was really dependent on who you knew um, and information that was out there. You have these like really complicated registries. You try and search for a clinical trial, get hundreds of results. There's so much information, it's impossible for a patient to try and navigate. So that was kind of the genesis of seeing the problem. Um, started working on it, I guess, for a year um, and seeing if we could build something for patients to make it really easy for them to navigate clinical trials. And I guess a year in, after doing TechCrunch and um, sort of raising the seed round, I made the decision to defer my final year of med school and haven't been back since. So. Um, it's been four years of deferring, but it's exciting to, you know, see the impact that we're now having on patients and, and them accessing trials and treatments. Uh, it doesn't sound like you're going back to med school anytime soon based on, based on the success. Um, I would love to just understand a little bit more, you know, obviously you noticed this problem in a field that you were really closely working in. The jump from medical school and clinical trials to founding a tech company is quite a big leap. What was that journey like? When did you realize that the solution here was actually building a venture-backed tech company? Like, I'm really curious to understand that. Yeah, I guess it was weird. Like, I had no idea about anything to do with, like, I guess, tech companies or um, startups. I, I, I started reading a few, like, books, like, Zero to One and... Um, you know, I think originals and a few books that were about sort of people f solving problems and, and um, building companies. And I thought that was interesting. But I think the real genesis was, as I was percolating on the on like this problem, um, I approached one of my friends. He was a doctor turned software engineer. He's the only one I knew. And I think um, not many of them exist in the world. And I was like, hey, this is this is a problem. What do you think about it? And um, he actually introduced me to the world of health tech and was like, you should check out, you know, Verily, um, you know, in the US, you should check out these companies. This is what's happening in health tech. And I think that's where I really like the idea was seated that actually you can solve problems in healthcare using technology. And there was, you know, it was like 
the space was really starting to take off in the US. There weren't actually that many health techs around in Australia, but um, I think that's how I first came across startups. And, and then TechCrunch was a huge um, catalyst and accelerator. And being able to go to Silicon Valley and spend some time over there was really uh, motivating to see that you, know, you can solve some pretty um, difficult problems that have huge impact using technology. Was there anything in particular about going over to Silicon Valley that like changed your perspective that you brought back and incorporated into how you were building Health Match? I think it was the people that I met and like the way, like just like the boldness and the pace at which everyone was operating. Like I went um, around Christmas time and just also went to a lot of like social catch ups where like everyone had like was either a founder or a VC or working in a really cool tech company. And it was pretty inspiring to see like the problems people were working on and like no problems seemed to be too big. So um, I think that was sort of the takeaway for me is like, you know, if you want to tackle this, like it's, it's doable. And maybe that was like being a naive 23, 24 year old. I was like, oh yeah, it's, it's going to be easy. Um, but it was just inspiring seeing the people in the valley and what they were doing oh, that's amazing uh, just being pulled up a level of ambition it sounds like um i would love to dive into just the specifics of how you then took this idea and this problem that you'd identified and actually then mapped that to building your first mvp and building conviction that you could actually solve it through technology um we've got i think as i mentioned uh, there's a fair few people in the audience that I can see that have just recently finished our Founders Fellowship Program. And they have gone through this process of, okay, well, what are the problems I'm passionate about? Where can I see pain points in the world? And then trying to bridge the gap between problem identification and building your first MVP to build conviction. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about what that process was like for you? Yeah, so I think it started out with us like building a prototype for TechCrunch and to see whether this was you know, something interesting that people would find interesting. Um, once we built the prototype, it was like, okay, we think this is a problem for patients, patients, you know, wanting, there are people out there wanting to access clinical trials for various condition areas. Um, let's start testing that. So we built out sort of a beta list before um, we actually launched of patients that were interested, went to like a lot of non-for-profits and patient groups and, and spoke to them about the problem. And, you know, like places like the Leukemia Foundation were like, do you have patients that come to you that struggle to find clinical trials or do people care about clinical trials because I'd anecdotally seen this but is this like at the scale that we think it is um, and then at the same time as doing this I started to speak to um, sort of lent on my network to speak to um, customers so large pharma companies biotechs people that were running these studies to figure out how much of a problem it was how they were tackling it whether they could whether you know approaching it the way that we were thinking of approaching it would actually solve this problem i think validated those two things and then the next step was like okay well how are you actually going to solve this with tech like what does what does that involve and for us like it seems like a really it's such a um you know matching patients to clinical trials seems like such a you know um, straightforward thing but actually like the complexity of what we built was how do we take really unstructured clinical trial eligibility criteria that's you know written in like 10 different ways across hundreds of trials and have it so that a patient can navigate a hundred lung cancer trials and all the criteria in it really efficiently. And to do that, we had to build our own way of like structuring, like a medical ontology to structure this criteria, had to build like a matching algorithm. So the product actually was like quite complex um, and trying to build and scale that and, and get it right. And I think, you know, we launched at the start of 2019 and it's, like there's been so much iteration since and so much learning but the first step was really to go you know do we have users how like do we have customers that are actually like this is going to solve a problem for us um and then to start building like the very base level of of what that solution can be mm, interesting um, we've started to have some questions come through the Q&A and that reminds me that I did a horrible job at the start saying, if anyone's in the audience with questions, please fill up the Q&A function because uh, I'd like to make sure we're talking about the things that are, that are interesting to all of you. Um, but, and there are some around problem validation, which I'll touch on in a second, but I'd love to, just while we're on that point of building your first product, understand, I've, we've spoken to founders where some are like, 
you know, build things really scrappily, get it in the hands of customers, see how they interact with it, and then kind of iterate from there. And then we've also had founders come in to talk at Startmate before, which are like, well, actually get the product right and to a point where customers can really engage with it and see the true potential of it before giving it to the customers. How did you approach that trade-off? Were you on one end of the spectrum or the other? Um, it sounds like it was quite a complex product. So really curious to understand um, how that worked on in your case. Yeah, I think for us, it was kind of like, in healthcare and dealing with like large global pharma companies, you kind of, you need to get their attention. You need to show a valuable product. You can't just be like, hey, let's, you know, iterate together. Like it's, it wasn't, you know, on one side we have sort of industry and the other side we have patients. I think patients are, have a lot more patience because there's like, you know, no solutions out there. They're really wanting to access treatments. Whereas on the other side, you've got to get cut through. So for us, I think we approached it, um, like it was really speak to the customers, figure out what they need, sort of show some prototypes um, and then build towards like something that actually, you know, delivers. Um, you know, when we were placing, originally placing patients into trials, we used to generate these like PDFs of what the patient's profile looks like and then send it to the trial site via email. It was really, it was scrappy, but it, it the end outcome was what the customer wanted, which is like a qualified patient. Um, then we got to a scale where we were doing like 2000 of these a month and it was impossible for our team to be doing this manually. So we built an interface for customers to log into and, and sort of, and we're building on that interface as we go. So I don't think you need to have a fully polished, perfected product. It's probably not the way to do it in, in startups and, and get to the scale that you need to and do it fast. But I think at, at least solving the problem and solving it right, especially in healthcare, is important to have that cut through. Mm, really interesting. Um, we've got a question here from Doug in the audience, and he's asking, when you were validating the problem that you identified, how did you go about testing your hypothesis with potential customers? Like, how did you actually go through that process? You said you spoke to many, many customers and patients and doctors and pharma companies. What was that process like in practice? Yeah, I think it was just uh, networking and trying to, like, you know, speak to the head of, like, clinical operations in in various, like, you know, pharma companies and, and be like, hey, you know, is recruitment a problem? Why are you guys struggling so much? What's the approach that you're taking? Would you be interested in something that can deliver patients directly to, to trials? And it was a, a lot of just like conversations and meetings. It's sort of discussing what Health Match was building before we even built it um, to get that validation. And then I think the important thing is to also balance that with knowing you know, we're solving this problem for patients, having conviction on the way you want to solve it and not getting too bogged down in like everything that every customer says, because you could be like, if you spend your time trying to like optimize exactly for what every customer wants, you're never going to deliver, like you're never really going to have that North Star and deliver what you need to deliver. Um, so it, it was really like get some feedback and then have real conviction on like how you think this problem is going to be solved. And, and on that conviction point, were there, was your initial hypothesis kind of proved correct in those early interviews or did you really have to kind of pivot and experiment with a, a range of different solutions before you landed on the thing that you had conviction was the right thing to really invest resources in to build? Well, I think it was in the sense that like, I knew that there was a problem there. The hardest thing is like, how are you going to engage like global pharma? And I think the thing that I realized from those conversations is um, at the end of the day, if you have the patients there um, and you have the platform that has all the patients, then your customers come to you. And, you know, pharma companies aren't adverse to trying different solutions and mm. you know, trying to solve this problem because they've been trying to do it for, for like decades. But the way to get their attention is to have something um, that they that they want ultimately, which is to find the right patients for these studies. So our thing was like, focus on the patients, focus on building real value for patients, drawing them to the platform. Um, and I think for us then like launching, launching Health Match, um, the initial sort of like proof points were that we were starting to attract um, a ton of patients and into condition areas that I didn't think about. Like originally I sort of approached it from like oncology and cancer, but we, we started assigning up patients for, you know, chronic sort of probably lower impact conditions like, you know, psoriasis or obesity or, um, you know, 
I don't know, arthritis, like chronic conditions that impact people's quality of life. Um, and that was a surprise, like seeing like actually there are people out there, they're not necessarily searching for trials, but if you put that in front of them and say, here's a new treatment um, like option that you can take, um, people with conditions are pretty keen to, to explore that. Yeah, oh, that's really interesting. I, I, it, sounds, it sounds to me, and as I said right at the start, health tech's not a field I have deep domain expertise in, um, but it sounds like there would have been this challenge at the start of finding kind of sufficient liquidity to match people with trials and then also getting trials on the other side of your, of your business. How did you approach kind of building that out in the right way so that when patients came to you, there was something you could offer them that was valuable to them and they didn't just drop off and go somewhere else? Yeah. And this is like, this is probably the biggest piece. Like we're essentially building a marketplace and, you know, it's the classic chicken and egg problem with marketplaces and building liquidity. But the one advantage we had is all these trials that everyone was running was list, were listed on public registries. And so we scraped public registries, took the data from that, structured the trials, onboarded them onto our platform so that when someone signed up with lung cancer, automatically we had 50 lung cancer trials. And then we let patients match to these trials, apply to trial sites. And then we would go to these trial sites and be like, hey, we have, you know, three patients for your super rare lung cancer trial that you haven't been able to recruit anyone for. And that was so powerful because that's what then gets the attention of trial sites. And, and, and we started to build the flywheel like that. And that was a huge focus um, for us. Like, and it has been a huge focus for us over the last like year and a half is just continuing to build liquidity um, mm -hmm. because, and, and now the strategy really is, is focus on where the patients are. So as we see, growth areas and demand areas from patients will make sure that we bolster up supply in those condition areas as well. Mm. It's, it's really interesting. We had um, someone come in and talk at Open House yesterday working in kind of fitness tech. Um, and he was talking a lot about the, the kind of magic moments that you try and create for your customers. Um, I'd, I'd love to understand a little bit how you think about building kind of magical customer experiences for your customers on both sides, because it sounds like the pharma companies are the ones that are paying you, but then there's the, the kind of the patients on the other side who you want to deliver a really great experience to as well. And I'd just love to understand that dynamic a little bit more and how you've thought about that as you've scaled the business. Yeah, this is a really interesting one because we didn't want to like dilute our focus too much by like trying to split it between pharma and patients. And I think it, it again comes to that North Star of like, if you build like a really valuable product for patients and you focus on um, delivering access to patients, like pharma will come and industry will come. And so from day one, it's like, continue to build and optimize the product so patients get the best value out of it. And for us, it's like, if people are coming to the platform, creating profiles, entering like really in-depth medical data um, on themselves, then they're wanting something out of it, which is they're wanting to match to a trial. They're wanting to see themselves ultimately be placed into a study. So um, yeah, everything we do in product and growth is really patient focused and patient centric and by doing that, um, the interesting thing is we've continued to get like more and more attention from pharma companies and industry because we now have like the pool of patients that everyone wants um, and that everyone wants to access. So I think it's like keeping the focus um, specific and and um, on the patients has been really helpful. That's really interesting. And is the moment at least that you see that you're kind of delighting the, your patients then, is that when they get matched with a trial? Is it kind of after they get their results, is it further down the track? Like what does that um, customer journey look like? Yeah, I guess we measure at different points, but a match is like the ultimate thing. People come on the platform because they want to be able to see mm. if there is something available for them. So mm. ensuring that we have great supply and coverage is, is really important so that if anyone, any condition area and, you know, regardless of what their profile looks like, we'll get something out of it. Um, then the ultimate value exchange is that they can, they match, they apply to that study and we're able to place them into that trial. Um, and that's like ultimately what health match can do in terms of improving access and giving people access. So um, yeah, we sort of look at metrics. The match is the first like real delight that we can give patients and then ultimately placing them into trials. Oh, that's so interesting. It's such a complex customer journey. Um, I'll, I'll come back to customers in a second, but you touched on something that was interesting uh, to me around kind of 
the uniqueness of building a business in in health tech and the need for credibility in that space like i can well i imagine that the, the bar for someone being willing to give you all that data like this week i went through the sign up flow and i was like okay well i know what health match is and i i'm about to talk to manuri so i'm willing to kind of hand over some of this data but particularly in the early days like how important was you building credibility with both sides of that marketplace to actually get it off the ground yeah i mean it was important but it wasn't as um like because we're focusing on patients and and building these um, flows for patients to match them to trials. I think the most important thing is that we had trials for patients to actually match and apply to. That was the that was the key. Um, and you know, I look back at the product that we launched with, and I'm like, you know, as most people say, you should be pretty embarrassed by it. Like the progress that we've made in terms of what the questionnaire looks like, the engagement we have with patients is so much better, so much smoother. But people were pretty willing to to hand over really in depth details, and I think that speaks to the the problem that we're tackling is that people just like if you have cancer, if you have these conditions, you just want to know what else is out there, and the motivation is super high, you know. And interestingly, we've recently been learning as well as we're optimizing growth and optimizing landing pages, and what we're finding is people want less information in our space like landing pages that are shorter and get to the point and get people straight into the flow have higher conversion because people are like well I'm here I'm here to like the intent is really high once you get in front of them so that was a surprise like to be honest in healthcare you would think that you need to actually convince people and you need to build like a lot of credibility but I think it it's probably true in a lot of like spaces within health healthcare and health tech but if the motivation is really high, I think um, that stands probably less true. Mm. And have you found it's, it's possible to, you know, if someone signs up and there's not a trial that's currently available for them, like how, what does it look like to re-engage those people at the right time? How do you do that? What does that look like? Yeah, so we have like constant re-engagement. So, you know, we're constantly building up trial supply. And so as new trials are added, um, patients are notified, you know, hey, there's a new question that you need to answer or there's a new trial that you might be suitable for. Um, and our engagement rates are really high with those patients that get notified um, because they've, you know, actively come to the platform and created a profile for a reason. Um, so we're continuing to build on our engagement piece, which is, you know, currently we notify patients of, of new trials, but we know um, there's real value in building community in, in these condition areas as well, where there's just a platform for people to like come and, and speak about their, their condition area as well. So, you know, as we, again, like our, our real focus is like the patients and building the go-to patient network. Um, if you do that, like, you know, the hypothesis is win the patients, you win the market. Mm. Um, so we're continuing to like layer onto the product things that are interesting for patients and valuable for them. Yeah, interesting. Um, on that, it sounds like you've had some pretty incredible growth recently. Can you maybe even just talk about like where you were 12 months ago from a patient perspective and like where you are today and how you've how you've actually achieved that growth? Because I, I, I saw the numbers and they look pretty staggering. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we like just spoke again, it was like we went through a period where we were starting to think about like, you know, how hard do we push on revenue and monetization versus growth and I think you know most companies probably go through that um, and that happened this year and we we actually took a real stance and going actually the way that you win this market again is focusing on the patients and so and focusing on growth um, it's exciting we were able to like build out a pretty um, pretty skilled growth team we ended up hiring Andre who used to be the head of growth at Canva um, and, you know, he's known for like building out the SEO playbook and um, we're also, you know, go direct to patients on, on Facebook and have really been able to drive down our metrics and drive up our conversion, which is exciting over time. So I think in, like we're now at like almost 170,000 users on Health Match and 35,000 of them have been in the last 30 days. So we opened up the US as of 10 days ago. Um, and it's it's going pretty wild over there. But um, I think, yeah, now that we've got the product right, now that we've got a lot more understanding on how the funnel works, we're just mm. putting the foot down and, yeah. um, and focusing on that. 
And how do you acquire customers? What is the funnel at the moment? Because I could imagine there'd be so many different channels that you could go through to try and find patients that are suffering with a particular chronic disease. Um, how do you, where do you find most of your customers now? Yeah, so multiple channels that we use. Um, so our paid channels are really in Facebook, like that's been incredibly efficient and we've just continued to drive efficiency in that. It used to like cost, I don't know, oncology patients, very expensive, but pharma will also pay a lot of money for oncology patients. And we used to like acquire them for, you know, $150, $200. Um, and now we have our like acquisition numbers are, are down to $10 for oncology patients. Um, so we've had huge gains in, in how we acquire on through paid channels, but we also have SEO cranking and a lot of organic channels moving um, as well as partnerships. So a whole bunch of just like direct to patient strategies that are working. Yeah. Um, and I think the key again is like the value exchange. If you can really like have value exchange for every user that comes to the platform, mm -hmm. that organic piece and sort of that word of mouth also starts cranking. Yeah, interesting. Um, we we had Rod from CultureAmp come on and talk to us on Monday this week. And one of the things he was saying about the early days of CultureAmp was getting the product right was really important, but also like getting the business model right for them at least was really important. And that kind of, until they got that piece right and they really understood their buyer and the difference between the buyer and their end user, um, they, they kind of didn't see that level of conviction and the growth that they were hoping for. Your business model is quite different to the Coltrane business model, but I'd be curious how true that statement is for you. Like, did you have to validate on the business model and iterate on the business model as much as you did on the product in the early days? Or was that quite clear to you what that needed to be at the start? Yeah, I mean, we're constantly iterating on the business model. I think, you know, we we just went through a phase of sort of changing our, our approach to the business model in terms of, you know, we're still charging the pharma companies and sponsors, but how we do that is very different because we're like, how do we minimize friction? How do we like, you know, we're working with like big global companies that are really slow in procurement. So how do we make it that once we get them on board, we lock them in, we can expand across their trial pipeline. So I think, you know, you're constantly, yeah, it's right. Like you, you have to iterate on your business model as well. I don't think you ever really get it right at the start. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, like, you know, we've made a, quite a few like iterations on it to get it to a place where now it aligns well with also our growth approach and our approach to winning patients. Yeah, that's really interesting. How, how much of that, it sounds like that's been quite a recent focus, but right at the start of your journey, what we were talking about before, was that a focus at that point as well? Or was it really just customer understanding at that point? And then you've iterated on the business model further down the track? Yeah, I think it was, um, I think it was a lot of customer understanding and understanding of like, you know, where, like, where sort of do, does the kind of money flow? Like, how much is pharma paying to, to run a clinical trial? How difficult is it for them to recruit? What are the current like economics and unit economics that are in place? And then we sort of just like picked a number in terms of what we thought was, you know, a market number that would be attractive to pharma and went with it. And that was at the, at the time, it's like, we didn't really have that much data because you there isn't data out there in terms of how much you could charge for an oncology patient in a really rare trial versus, you know, a diabetes patient. So we had to take a bit of like a educated guess at what that is and hope that it, it stuck with the customers that we went out to. Um, and then over time, obviously, like as we learn more and more about the space and the difficulties and the challenges and how much capital actually is, um, you know, pulled into trials and, and, and making them efficient, we were able to then adjust as we went. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. There's just so many different ways we could take this conversation right now because it sounds like you are kind of building a category almost um, and an entirely new thing that has never existed. We'll we'll touch on that in a second and your, your thoughts on where the kind of industry is going. But I would love to circle back to the conversation we were having around customers and even just understand, like there's a question here in the chat from Scott, just asking around who was your first paying customer? How did you get to that point and actually get them over the line? Um, and then what was it like going from one to 10 to, you know, has that journey been pretty clear or has, has your customers changed over time? What's that, what did that process look like? Yeah, I think we were like fortunate in the sense that our first like paying customer happened to be like Roche, uh, which is like 
probably the largest global pharma company um, and we were able to get them locked in in Australia and in Hong Kong and we had huge conviction and I think the reason we were able to get like a, a global pharma company's attention was the approach that we were taking to this problem like no one was really tackling it from a patient's perspective um, and going actually like um, a lot of people have tried to solve the recruitment problem in clinical trials and solve, solve the inefficiencies. And the more you dive into the space, you, the more you realize like how broken it is and how inefficient it is. And our approach was sort of innovative to them, which is like actually focus on the patients, bring the patients, like, you know, uh, give them a platform and then, you know, design clinical trials for patients, um, follow the demand, really take a different approach so I think having Roche really align with our mission was a huge thing for us and they've been a customer with us for the last three years um, and you know a partner essentially as we've been scaling across geographies mm-hmm. um, and so that helped as well getting a name like Roche on board has helped a lot with the other pharma companies and and biotechs and so we've been able to expand like that and I think again that point on the flywheel and getting the flywheel turning because we were able to prove the product worked. We were able to prove that we could recruit so quickly and place patients into trials really efficiently because of the approach we were taking. Mm. We're able to then convert more and more customers over time. That's really interesting because, I mean, selling into enterprise is often a startup's worst nightmare. And it sounds like you started not just with enterprise, but like at the biggest end of enterprise you could possibly start. How did you actually go about closing that deal when you were so early in your journey? Yeah, it was, it was weird. It was, again, it was like, came down to networking and trying to find the right people. Um, I happened to meet the, the GM of Roche in New Zealand. Um, they were a fan. They sort of shared it with the exec level. Um, and I think like the biggest thing was like, yeah, at the end of the day, these large enterprise organizations are people. And if you can like find the people that sort of align with what you're building and get real advocates within these organizations, you can push them. I think we closed that Roche deal within three months, which was crazy at the time, Um, you know, and it hasn't necessarily sped up in terms of how we close deals with like larger pharma companies because procurement takes a long time, but usually you can get the commercials in place quickly. Mm. But yeah, it's about finding advocates. Like it, it is intimidating when you're talking to like large enterprises, but again, in the same way that when you're raising capital, you sort of, um, share the vision and share like what you're trying to achieve if you can do that with um customers um you can convert them fairly fairly well Mm, interesting so it sounds like storytelling is a really important part of that for anyone that's in the audience that's thinking well i don't i don't know where to start and finding my advocates do you have any suggestions on how they might start breaking down that problem yeah i think you know look at your problem space look at who your customers are you know there's obviously a lot of research that needs to go into the background. Like who are the people that, who are the decision makers that you need to try and get in front of and then find a way to get in front of them. Um, You know, I have had no real networks in industry or in pharma, like as a med student that's never worked before, but like, you know, find where these people are at, like what sort of events are they going to and and try to get in front of them. And um, yeah. And then share like the vision, um, and the best thing is to do your homework and know, you know, who actually is aligned to the vision and aligned to what you're building. And I knew that Roche as a company had invested in other um, health tech companies and were really like patient centric. So they were a great first customer to go after. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, changing pace slightly to a question we've got in the, in the uh, Q&A here. Um, I'd love to understand a little bit, we'll start with kind of the future as you see it for health match and clinical trials, because it sounds like you, it, it evolved from this recognition that the way that patients got connected to trials was pretty broken. Um, to what extent do you see health match just bridging the gap in the process? Or do you see health match actually playing a role in completely reinventing how clinical trials are run in the future? Like, what do you see the future for health match being in, in being able to influence the industry? Yeah, I think uh, absolutely. We want to like reinvent the way clinical trials are done. We started off thinking like, okay, recruitment is the problem. We're solving recruitment. And the more time we've spent in this space, the more you realize how broken it is because of the approach that's being taken to clinical trials. Um, Keeping the patient at the center and keeping them in mind, we want to change the way trials are done. So 
now that we have like, you know, we're building the demand, we're building that patient network, we know what the population looks like. So we can actually inform what clinical trials are done. We can like inform drug development. So it's like, you know, where should you set up your trials? How should you design your trials? What criteria should you use? Um, you know, which molecules to take bets on because you actually know where the demand and the patients are. Um, and that seems really like it's weird that that's novel, but that is really novel in the space that, you know, you, you take the demand and then you build for it and build more patient centric trials. And I think that's what we want to do. I think over time, you know, we've got this platform, you know, we might even stretch into things like drug development because we know where people are actually, yeah. you know, wanting um, solutions. Yeah, interesting. Um, and the extension, the second part of that question is, um, in just in health tech more broadly, and I, but I guess we can keep it focused to kind of drug discovery in patients with, with chronic disease. Um, where do you see the industry today in Australia, particularly relative to the rest of the world? And is there a particular direction it's moving in? I'm just really curious if you've seen any kind of thematics there. Yeah, well, I think health tech in general has really taken off in the last couple of years. Um, Australia has started to develop a bit of an ecosystem with like you know, a number of like really cool health tech companies out there. Um, so I, I do see like the space warming up. I think everyone knows about FinTech, everyone knows about EdTech, like it, it's kind of a newer category, but if you look to the US, like um, we're probably like five years behind the US in terms of how like, um, how hot the space is and how much innovation is happening there. And um, the cool thing is like turning to the US, you see more and more focus on um, driving sort of consumer centric healthcare and patient centric healthcare. And I think that's the direction we're going in is where we empower patients more, we make healthcare less paternalistic and less deter like less reliant on who you know, which clinician you're visiting. Um, so I think that's really cool. And it's cool to see that Australia's ecosystem in health tech is taking off. Yeah, that's awesome. What an awesome vision. Um, we've got a question here in the chat from Tova, who's actually one of our wonderful founders fellows. Um, there's a question around scaling your team. And it sounds like I might have the number slightly wrong here, but it sounds like in 2019, you're about a team of five people. And you're now, how many people are you now? Oh, wait, I think we're just over 35. Yeah, 35 yeah, people. Awesome. Um, what, like, how have you scaled the team? Like, do you have a particular approach to the types of people you're looking for? Like, how have you actually gone through that process? Yeah, I think um, it's really one of the biggest things in building a company is like the people you bring on and and ensuring that, um, you know, you're, you're bringing people that align really well to, to the mission. So I think, you know, the way that I think about hiring is like, you know, values is super important and people that align to the mission are, are super important because as you as you go through the sort of ups and downs of scaling a company and and sort of um the yeah the the pace that you're operating at it's so important to have people that like really believe in that sort of north star um and then the other thing is like you know the other thing to look at is like horsepower versus experience and you know what I think we've tend to do is like lean more towards horsepower and index on people that are like really hungry and ready to learn and would love to be in sort of that startup environment. And that's played out really well. Obviously there are certain roles where you want more experience and you want someone that, you know, has scaled or, or, um, you know, built a team before. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think like the key though, at the end of the day is like find people that really believe in the mission and what you're building um, because like yeah then then you get the right mix of people on board and culture is so important so um, it's what helps like through all the hecticness of, of scaling a company. Interesting I'd love to double click on that idea of horsepower can you maybe define what you mean by horsepower and then how you actually test for it in an interview process? Yeah I think um, horsepower wise I think it's really like you know the questions that we ask people, like the tasks that we get people to do. And just generally you can you can get a sense of, you know, how like passionate and hungry someone is to be able to jump in and sort of do what it takes in a startup. You kind of need to be a bit more open, especially at our scale. Like as you scale, like there's probably less generalists involved, but you need people that can are happy to sort of do whatever it takes within their role. Um, and so there are certain questions that we ask to, to test that. Um, 
yeah so i think when you generally when you speak to someone you can get a good sense of like you know, sense. how 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 willing they are to jump into things that's really interesting um we've spoken about scaling the team uh what about scaling internationally it sounds like you've just launched in the u.s I mean, healthcare is one of those heavily regulated industries that changes from market to market. How did you go about scaling internationally and picking the US as that market? Yeah, I think from day one, we always knew that the, this model would probably work better in the US because it's about going direct to patients um, and connecting them with trials where you get access to like the best cutting edge healthcare and in a in a, like market where the healthcare system is so broken, um, you have more opportunity and just generally the US is a much larger market than Australia. So yeah, we launched there 10 days ago. Um, it's been really exciting to see the growth and the uptake. Um, people, you know, all our conversion rates, our user growth, everything is like so much higher than Australia. Um, it's really exciting to see that. And I think it just speaks to the fact that, yeah, like people are more motivated because they have less access. Like, mm-hmm. You know, not everyone has insurance. Not everyone can afford to go to, um, you know, Mass Gen or Mayo Clinic. So people are wanting to know what options are out there. And, um, yeah, it's – and the good thing is because we don't interact with the healthcare system, we're going direct from patients to trial sites or sponsors mm-hmm. and not wor- worrying about everything in between. You can scale pretty efficiently in different markets. Yeah, that's really interesting. And how have you thought about scaling the team internationally? I think there's lots of different schools of thought, like – you know, are you opening offices? Are you just expanding the product internationally, but everything's here? Like, how have you actually thought about that process of scaling the team? Yeah, well, we launched without having anyone on the ground. We've just hired our first person um, in the US, Mm -hmm. but, you know, the products can, you know, it's a tech product, it can scale. Like, the, the biggest thing for us was, do we have enough supply in the US? How do we get enough trials and enough trial sites? So we launched with about, 500 trials in the US and 8,000 trial sites. And so that that gives plenty of like opportunity for patients in the US to match the trials and for us to get that liquidity happening in the US. Um, And so then the thoughts for us are, you know, product engineering growth we can have in Australia. There's no real need for us to scale um, those teams in the US, but our go-to-market teams will probably be building out in the US just so that there are people with, boots on the ground and they can operate on the US time zones. Yeah, interesting. There's a question here um, from Rosa asking, does it make a difference that the US is a private healthcare based system versus public healthcare like it is in Australia, Canada and the UK? Has that changed the go to market motion at all? Um, So in terms of like patients, the only difference that it makes is that patients are more motivated. Mm -hmm. Australia, we've got a pretty good safety net, like people are, you know, generally like Public healthcare system is great. Your clinician will tell you about a lot of treatment options. In the US, because the system is so broken and people are so reliant on, you know, they need to have insurance or private health, it, it opens up the opportunity even more. Mm-hmm. Um, and because the whole point of health match is to provide equity of access. So we're able to reach more people and provide more access um, to a greater number of people mm-hmm. in the US. So um, that's really what, what's changed in terms of the industry side of things. It's pretty much the same, like trials are really broken and they struggle in the U S as well. So we take the same approach. Awesome. Um, I'd love to kind of change tack to the last major topic that I wanted to touch on, but I'd love to understand you've done a fair few funding rounds now. And one of the questions we get at Startmate pretty regularly is just how to think about fundraising one the trade-off between self-funding and fundraising taking external capital and then if you do go down that route of taking external capital you know how do you go about finding the right people and choosing an investor and convincing them to part with their um their capital um i'd I'd just love to understand it even just starting at that first point um on bootstrapping versus taking external funding like did that play into your decision to raise your first round like what were those dynamics at play for you yeah, I think like the important thing with external funding is it's like what type of business do you want to build? Like from day one, it's like from day one when you health match, like it's a global problem. We want to build a global uh, business and we want to scale this really fast and efficiently, mm. uh, which means that, you know, 
like we could have sort of slowly kind of built revenue and slowly built a customer base and sort of bootstrapped and, and scaled to a certain degree. But like doing that, we probably would have just turned into a recruitment agency for, for patients um, or another sort of player in that space. But actually the vision was much larger. It's like, you know, we want to really change the way mm -hmm. drug development is done. Um, so it, it depends on like, and neither is right or wrong. Like there are plenty of very successful, you know, bootstrapped companies that have decided to focus on a very specific market or, or getting to a certain, certain size. It's just really like, what do you want to do? So I think if you've got like that really big sort of um, ambition around building a global company, then uh, external capital is helpful. It, it buys you time and it buys you the ability to move fast and, and scale fast. Mm, that's really interesting. So when, what was your first round? When did you first take external funding? Um, so post TechCrunch, it was, um, you know, coming back, um, raising a seed round to, to, you know, hire engineers and actually build the product. And, and that only really happened because, yeah, we did TechCrunch, went to, went to the Valley and um, started speaking to investors and around sort of kicked off in, in terms of, um, you know, raising that first seed. Hmm. Um, yeah. And, and that's kind of how it happened. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I guess, I guess what I'm, I'm curious to understand whether there are any like tactical things that you did to identify who you wanted to take investment from. And maybe this isn't just something that you can share from the first round, but any of the rounds, like how have you actually approached identifying the list of people that you want to talk to and tactically working through them and kind of getting buy-in there from the right people? Yeah, I think it's really important to try to take smart money and people that are going to add value, especially at the start. Like, you know, a lot of the investors that we took on in the seed round were just private angel investors that I'd either met over in the Valley or, you know, they used to be the head of like a pharma company or they had like something that they could bring to the table. So um, we had a really good diverse set of investors. Like we had Anton from WhatsApp, who was like really great at product design. So you could bounce ideas off him. You know, I, I, like I mentioned, we had an ex MD of AstraZeneca where I could sort of test industry ideas on. And that was like, it wasn't just capital then it was like capital plus, you know, youthful knowledge and insights. Um, and then I think as we've done like the next couple of rounds, the most important thing and the lesson that I've learned is like find investors that have real conviction in the mission and the problem you're solving. Just like with when you're hiring team members, like you want everyone to be so aligned in like what is the big picture goal and what are you driving towards? Mm. Um, and yeah, I think that's the most important thing is like, yeah, find that alignment. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, I think that's a great piece of advice. Um, given that you were fairly new in the tech ecosystem and you probably didn't have those networks, like how did you think about even just building the relationships with the right people where you were kind of starting from, from ground zero for anyone in the audience that might not have the right connections to those people who, who are smart money, as you were saying? Um, do you have any thoughts there on how they should go about kind of, I guess, hacking connections? Yeah, I think like, it, I think it's all about like networking. Like I had absolutely, like I didn't do a friends and family round. I had no connections in the space. I think um, going to the Valley, sort of going to certain events, I met people like, I, I met like the ex, um, well, she was the VP of IP and litigation at Google mm. um, and happened to sort of previously um, work in, in pharma world and met her at a Christmas party event, um, got coffee the next day, spoke about like what um, health match was and what we wanted to build. And she ended up writing an angel check. And so we built this whole network of like angel and first in investors just from meeting people and, and being really open to taking meetings. And I think like, I just spoke to so many people at the very start of the journey um, to pull around together. And then, you know, as you kind of scale, as you get larger, it becomes easier in a way, um, mm. because you start to meet more people and, and investors. So you've closed four rounds now, if that's right. Um, does it get any easier? Do the dynamics change between the rounds? Um, how's that played yeah. out? Yeah, I don't know if it gets easier, but I think you learn how, um, you sort of learn lessons around how to pull around together, mm. how to create interest, how to, uh, not shoot yourself in the foot by, you know, 
overhyping yourself on valuation or how much you want to raise like there's almost like a bit of an art to like pulling around together and I think you kind of learn it by doing doing that um yeah, yeah. so it's just I think the biggest thing is like creating FOMO and and that's what um often like drives rounds to close yeah awesome um, well, we've got probably time for two or three more questions. There's one last question in the Q&A here, which I'll throw to you, and then I've got a couple up my sleeve. Um, what are the most important factors to consider in healthcare when building an MVP, particularly in the early stages of validation? Is there anything in particular that comes to mind when you hear that question? So what is important about building? Um, yeah, what, what's important to consider if I'm a founder right at the start that's thinking about building an MVP in, in healthcare specifically? Yeah, I think it. I think super important to test it out with your future customers and users. Like, you know, I think if I was to do health match again, like you could actually test and validate so much more before even building like the initial um, MVP and product by just having like, you know, no code tools and just design interfaces that you test out with customers and see if see if like there is true buy in. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that would be the approach. And then once you have that, just do the very base level of like, you know, um, the very base level of what that product would require. Because yeah. it is tempting to make it look slick and and super nice, but provided it works and delivers the end outcome, that's the most important thing. And then you just layer on top of that. I think that's an awesome piece of advice. Don't try and make it look too slick. Just get it in, get it in the hands of customers when it's doing yeah. the thing that you want it to do. Yeah. And I know people say in healthcare, like, don't, you know, you, you're not meant to move fast and break things, but you still want to move fast. You still want to iterate um, and use data to like change the way, you know, you do things. So mm -hmm. don't get bogged down on like perfecting it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, I've got two final questions for you and I've asked all of our other speakers these questions as well um, this week. Um, the first is, uh, what's the best piece of advice you've received in your journey as a founder? Is there something that really resonates with you to this day? Um, the best piece of advice, that's, that's a hard one. Um, I think it should really be about like selecting who, who I listen to hmm. advice from. I think, um, you know, I just remember at the very start of the journey, like thousands, you know, like you have so many people saying so many different things and it's just um, being very specific around the advice that you listen to. Otherwise you can go down some real rabbit holes. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that comes from, you know, uh, listening to people that have like proven sort of um, track records in what they're talking about. Um, so that's worked really well like when it comes to sort of who I listen to as well yeah. like you know I'll I'll listen to founders that are three four steps ahead of me around cap raising or growing a team because I know they've done it and mm. I know they're speaking from experience and their experience might not be exactly the same as what ends up happening at health match but then I can take a few of those things and synthesize it yeah. but um yeah be really specific about who you listen to Awesome. I think that's great. And something we encourage our founders at Startmate to do when they've got 150 mentors saying, do this, do this. Yeah. It's like pick who you listen to wisely. Yeah. And um, then trust your trust your gut and intuition that comes from that because you're the one that knows all the context. So pull yeah. that in. And yeah. Awesome. Um, and my final question for you is looking back at your, your journey to date, is there anything that you uh, look back at and wish you did more of, or maybe even conversely that you did less of. Is there something in the journey where you where that resonates? Um, wish I did more of. I think you know. Um, yeah, it's it's been hard. It's been like you kind of as as you're building a company, you you learn all these lessons, and then you look back and you're like, wow, if I did this again, I could just do it 10x faster. Yeah. Um, so it's really hard to say, like, you know, you learn lessons around like building teams and scaling culture and the right hiring people and you know um, all these things around company building. So I think like for me, um, the best, the most useful thing though is like now to like try and prepare by listening or like you know, trying to absorb as many podcasts or books or speaking to founders that are mm. steps ahead to try and miss some of those landmines because everyone learns the same lessons. And so if you can ex like accelerate past them by trying to like be a few steps ahead, it's really helpful. Um, but yeah, there's just been so many. 
Um, <laughs> awesome, hard to select yeah. one. Yeah. Um, well, look, I just want to say a massive thank you, Minori, for coming in and talking to us today. Um, I've certainly found this really insightful and it seems like the audience has as well. Um, so thank you. And I can't wait to see what you build with Health Match. It's an exciting uh, vision of the future that you're, you painted today. Awesome. No, thanks so much for having me. And hopefully it's been helpful for everyone on, the on today's panel today. It definitely has. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks, Ash.